So I just want to warn you guys, if you hear my dying son in the background, he's got croup and he's pretty sick and he's on the couch. So you can hear him cough. So I apologize, but I have to get this video done. I've done it. I've redone it like seven times every time he coughs. So now I'm just warning you guys, you have to listen to his cough. So why am I covering the Santa Claus murders and what are the Santa Claus murders? No, Santa Claus didn't murder anyone. Um, but this story is really, really interesting for so many different reasons. It has every facet of sex, drugs, rock and roll, drugs, um, a small little town named Santa Claus, a town of 300 people. Um, but they, it's surprisingly enough, they actually know what criminology is and they know how to handle a crime scene. Unlike some other people at, at Wisconsin. So... Let me get into it because there's a lot of information and I'm doing a live at 830 and it's already 710. So I have to get this done. So these are the four people that were murdered. And it happened in 1987 on December 4th in a little tiny town of 300 people called Santa Claus, Georgia. It's about 70 miles um, west of Savannah. Um, When you pull into town, there's a tiny little sign that says... Um, Santa Claus, the town that loves children, city that loves children. So seven people lived in this very picturesque kind of home in Santa Claus. They lived on, I think it was Slay Road or something like that, Dasher Street, one of them. It included three foster children, two adults, and it was three foster kids that they were going to adopt. Danny, and this is Danny, lived in, he was a mailman, lived very nice, um, met Kim, who was about 10 years younger. And what makes it so nice is that they were together for seven years. Kim was a drug addict. She was living out of her car. Um, she had nothing. She had lost her kids. And here comes her Prince Charming, who, even though he was 10 years older, he was a local mailman, completely got her off drugs, got her kids back. And they were living the perfect, you know, picturesque life. And they lived on, yeah, they lived on Rudolph Way, or they have neighbors that lived on Rudolph Way, Dancer Street, Slay Street. I mean, can you imagine living in this fucking town? I couldn't. Hell no. Um, around four o'clock in the morning, in another town about 45 miles away, a farmer and his wife are woken by their dogs, nonstop barking. You can imagine this guy probably grabbed his gun, like, who's on my property? And they look out the window and they see three kids, young kids, at four o'clock in the morning in a nightgown, in nightgowns like shaking, didn't know what was up. They called the police instantly. And to much to their surprise, um, they found out from these kids that not only were they in shock, but they were actually coherent. And they said that they were taken from their home in Santa Claus earlier in the morning. And the oldest girl had been raped and sodomized. These kids were scared to death. They told the police where they lived and two deputies were dispatched to the house, arriving shortly before noon. And now you can imagine though, in such a small town, it's got to be eerie. And it, like you probably hear crickets and I mean, granted it's December, but it, like the most noise you're going to hear is an occasional car passing or something like that. I mean, that's how small the town was. So the cops knocked, nobody answered. Now, they didn't know if they were walking into a crime scene or if these kids, something else was going on, you know, if these kids were abandoned. But, you know, they were kind of getting eerie. They were getting kind of weird because this just didn't seem right, especially in a small little town. It was pitch black inside. So after attempts, I'm sure they called in, tried to reach somebody. They went inside to investigate. They turned on lights. They used their flashlights. They didn't want to disturb any fingerprints if they were, so they wanted to make it as light as possible. Um, they had their guns at ready, ready to see a perpetrator just in case. So when they reached the master bedroom, the deputies were in shock at what they saw. They saw 43-year-old Danny was sprawled out next to 33-year-old Kim, who was his wife. Uh, they were drenched in blood, and the heavy caliber weapon used that the killer used, which is this guy who's on death row, by the way, um, had a shattering effect. So that's a nice way of 
putting that all their organs and shit were all over the walls, all over everything. So then they went down the hall and they found Jessica, who's a 16 year old adopted daughter of Danny from a previous marriage. Um, they say that she was absolutely beautiful in person and in death, she had no face left. It, her entire face was blown off. Um, in the atmosphere, they found, they were walking around the house, see if there were any more bodies. And they found eight year old Bryant, who was this little boy who was hugging onto his teddy bear in his bed again with no face. His whole head was blown apart. So after they gained composure, which you can imagine they were probably throwing up because to me, when it says they're trying to gain composure generally means that they were trying to find, they were trying to stop throwing up because the horror scene was just so disgusting. And I mean, to me, I think of like cops from like Dukes of Hazard. and yes, I'm showing my age here, <clears throat> but like I've picked a Roscoe, you know, like, Oh my God, there's a murderer. I mean, it's a town of 300 stuff like this doesn't happen. Like if somebody robs a candy bar, it's probably like, you know what they're used to. So I, I totally, when I think cops walking around the house, I totally think of Roscoe. If you don't know who Roscoe is, I can't explain. So they started walking around the house to see if there were any more victims, any more bodies in the bedrooms. They didn't find anything, but what they heard something in a closet and they found a four year old and a 10 month old, both foster kids of Danny and Kim. They grabbed the children and retraced the steps, um, hoping not to disturb any kind of crime scene evidence. It's amazing to me that a four year old and a 10 month old or the four year old had to grab the 10 month old, but actually put them in the closet. I'm thinking that the four year old and the 10 month old shared a bedroom and they, the four year old grabbed the 10 month old and put him in the closet. That's the only thing that, I mean, they never really said how they ended up in the closet, but I like to think positively. So go Corey. Um, police were extremely shocked at what happened because I mean, it's a tiny little town of Santa Claus. Nothing like this has ever happened, which again, which is why I think of Roscoe, um, and authorities knew that they weren't going to be able to sort this out. Like somebody stole a candy bar. So it was wild and chaotic night for the police who discovered the killer had gained entrance through an open window in the rear house, in the rear of the house after killing casually in a way that literally would defy comprehension. He left without any of the Daniels possessions. He didn't rob anything. He didn't take any money. He didn't even, you know, take rings. So it was like, what the fuck was he after? Um, so during the Saturday morning, police learned from the surviving children that they were awakened by the burst of fire and being taken held hostage. He drove them out to the boonies where he raped the oldest girl about 45 miles away, turned them loose and onto Bacon Road. Children described the kidnapper's car as a black van with tinted windows and all points bulletin flashed across the airwaves with the precaution that the suspect could be considered armed and dangerous. As the investigators would soon learn though, the marriage seemed placid and ordinarily enough. Daniels was socially popular. Nobody hated them. And which to me is awesome considering Kim was a drug addict living out of her car in a small little town. Like everybody knew who she was. You know, and that like they gave her another chance and that's just awesome. And they gave her kids back. And I think that's what attracted me to the story is that, you know, so many times people get judged. Look at the Avery. I mean, look at Steven, like be, people do shit wrong and everybody judges. And I think it's wonderful that in such a small town where everybody knows everybody's business, you know, they gave her another chance and they accepted her and they accepted her in community and church and very, very religious people. So what also stuck out at me at this point was listen to what real crime scene investigators do when they have a crime scene. Wisconsin, please take notes. Anyone who was in uh, Manitowoc, please take notes at what you're going to hear. So little Brian, who's the eight year old hugging to his teddy bear, had been shot point blank through the head as he slept clinging to his teddy bear. The female victim in the hallway had her face almost entirely removed by the force of the weapon. There was so much blood in the bedrooms that authorities couldn't help wonder why there weren't more bloody fingerprints. They also found several 1100 Remington shotgun shells laying on the floor of each bedroom 
where the murders occurred. The cartridges laying on the bed beside Daniel and Kim had tissue fragments adhering to them. And I'm sorry you have to hear fluff and out of butter. I, I'm not redoing this video for the 10th time. After the scene was carefully photographed in both color and black and white, then videotaped, crime lab technicians collected blood and other bodily fluid samples, which were they cautiously marked according to source and location. Next, they vacuumed for trace evidence of hair and clothing fiber using divided filter bags for each location and searched identifiable latent fingerprints. So that's how a crime scene is done. When the criminalists were finished with the bodies at a crime scene, morgue drivers placed the corpses inside body bags and removed them one at a time to a waiting morgue wagon. As a small gathering of disbelieving neighbors looked on from behind yellow tape barriers, the frightful looking body haulers left the morgue where definitive post-mortems post would be performed. While sheriff's investigators and, and crime lab technicians searched for clues and collected evidence at the crime scene over the next few hours, the sheriff's uh, deputies questioned neighbors in search of the killer's identity. Unknown to them, though, the children actually gave them more information that ultimately found it's how they found out who it was. <clears throat> so the manhunt begins. Who done it? The identification of the killer had been made in a relatively easily matter. Um, Prosecutor Rick Malone told a hastily gathered group of reporters that authorities were still investigating the girls' accounts and released few details. He said they weren't positive what triggered the vicious midnight attack against the family. We do not think it was a random attack. We know that he did know them, said Malone. It seems he was a friend of the family or at least knew them. And he did. He was Kim's ex-boyfriend, jealous ex-boyfriend. So suddenly the little community named by an entrepreneur to attack tourism was on the map and a little town known for Christmas season decorations and community wide displays of luminaries suddenly came alive with an out of town curiosity seeker. So everyone wants to go to Santa Claus. I would have gone to Santa Claus during Santa time. So everything pointed to the inconceivable a man named Jerry Hedler had to enter the house and started shooting at random for no apparent reason. Maybe something else happened, but the problem was only that something else, he's the only one that would know. So theories and speculation about the once happy and serene Georgia city now unbelievably stunned by the shocking mass murder. It was almost too much to believe things like that just didn't happen in Santa Claus. I mean, most of notoriety, notoriety crimes and stuff happened in either Charleston or Savannah, which was like 70 miles away. Now, with any crime scene during those first critical hours for the manhunt, I've shifted into full gear with uniformed p patrolmen and uh, plains clothesmen ferreting out across Bacon County, where he was last pinpointed clear to Alma, where his family lived. So behind the house was a street and there was his van sat there. So GBI spokesman and GBI, if you're not familiar with Georgia, which has the most fucked up rules in the world. GBI is Georgia Bureau of Investigation instead of just Federal Bureau of Investigation because Georgia has to have their own rules for everything. Anyway, um, Jerry was walking out of the front door as the police car pulled into the front of the house. They made contact. He booked and ran into the house. So the two agents radioed for backup and then ran to the back of the house to prevent a possible escape. I mean, he just blew away four people, raped a young child that point Hydler's brother came out and told the officers that he was the only one in the house um I guess he thought the detectives were morons so they um called for backup the backup had arrived and initiated a search of the house they found Hadler huddled in a crawl space uh beneath the home so when asking him why like what he remembers of the day this is what he said and it's really pathetic um, he accounts of December 3rd and 4th were that he attended a funeral of a stillborn baby he had fathered to a woman he never saw before. That night, he walked into the home of a friend where they played pool, watched men playing dominoes. He had two beers, walked to his mom's ha house where he was staying without paying. What a nice guy. Um, when people in the home began talking about the stillborn baby, Heidler said he ran out of the house, swiped a friend's van, then drove... Uh, US-1 to Santa Claus. After entering the Daniels' home, he took a semi-automatic shotgun from a gun cabinet 
in Kim and Danny's bedroom, then went looking for Jessica, whom he wanted to kill because she jilted him. All right, I'm sorry. It was Jessica's ex-boyfriend, not Kim's. Um, he remembered continuously pulling the trigger. He even recalled having to reload how to kick off the towel. The kick of the shotgun hurt his shoulder and the clamorous thwack of the blast hurt his ears. Poor fucking guy. He said he shot Brian in a trance-like dream and was awakened out of it when Jessica called his name. After the shootings, he ushered the three kids out of the house and into the stolen van. Continuing with his story... He told the officers he remembered driving to the um, Alma River Bridge between Appling and Bacon Counties, where he took the 10-year-old to a boat ramp and sexually assaulted her out of sight of the others in the van. Like, he was just trying to be nice. How the fuck do you sexually assault a 10-year-old and sodomize a 10-year-old? Um, after the rape, the sobbing little victim asked him to get rid of the gun because he was scaring them. So he tossed it in the river, and unfortunately, the gun was never found. So skinny, sickly Heidler sniffed and wiped his nose on his shirt as the four death sentences were pronounced. Um, Judge Walter McMillan handed him an additional two life sentences plus 110 years on three counts of kidnapping and um, the three Daniels children and three counts of sodomy and child molestation and one burglary. Jury convicted Jerry of the following offenses, four counts of malice murder, kidnapping with bodily injury, two counts of kidnapping, aggravated sodomy, aggravated child molestation, child molestation, burglary for the murders. And, and that was just for the kids, the murders. Um, the jury recommended four death sentences, including as a statutory aggravating circumstances that each homicide was perpetrated during Heidler's commission of the other three and that all four deaths occurred during the commission of a burglary. The trial court denied Heidler's motion for a new trial and his appeals, any appeals. He has not gotten out. He's not appealed. He's still on death row. Um, and the cops had said that they were really good God fearing people. Um, and the neighbor told the cop, like they were a storybook family. They took children in like children that nobody else wanted. And that's what makes the whole thing so sad. So some moron who, he was like 20 years old. And I, I don't know, I'm sorry I messed up in the beginning. It wasn't Kim's, it was the daughter's. You know, like, and he blew away the whole fucking family for what? And raped a 10-year-old. It's, it's just so sad. So that's the story, Santa Claus murders. Santa Claus, Georgia has been on the map ever since. Um, like I said, there's so much to this story, but I definitely wanted to get a video out there and just another crime scene, uh, another crime case that remains someone on death row for what reason? He had no reason to do this. Um, I think, so that's what I have on this. I hope you guys enjoyed another story, Santa Claus story. Um, I have to give a shout out to Tanya Henry cause she's sending me Christmas cookies and in light of that, I told her if Dave Sale approved, I was going to do some a video, have a open mic for um, a Google Hangout on Saturday or Sunday for the Adam Braswell case. I know I just screwed up the name, um, but the case that the, her and Dave have been working on for like two years already. So I also want to say, check out my other videos. Um, thank you for hitting 5,000. You guys are amazing. We're at almost like 5,100 already. Um, and next goal is 10,000 tomorrow night. I will have this up and working. We're going to do the hundred dollar giveaway and I still am not sure if we're going to do four 25s or I was thinking of doing two 25s and one fifty. So, but we'll, we could discuss it tonight at the live. Okay. And I'm going live at eight 30 and I will see you guys shortly and have a fantastic night. And again, if you want to read more to it, there's tons of information on the Santa Claus murders. And I hope you guys have a fantastic night. I will close out with my closing. Ryan and Scott. Peace out, guys.